Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts what will happen if we don't change and what can we do to create a better future. I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. I think there's been a real shift lately on Instagram and social media in general away from buying trends to actually buying more consciously and more mindfully. I think it's it's still good for us to have those conversations and I just, I'd rather approach it in a more fun and lighthearted way, I think. Although the most sustainable garment is in your wardrobe already, you know, fall in love with it again, revalue it, revalue the resources and the time and the energy that's gone into it. Um, think about repairing it. On today's episode, we'll wrap up our look at the fashion and textile industry's waste crisis and find out whether or not we can be ethical consumers consumers while still managing to look fabulous. If you haven't heard part one of this series, which came out last week, have a listen. Otherwise, stay tuned to find out what happens next. During the COVID pandemic's many, many lockdowns, a lot of us picked up new hobbies. Your Instagram feed was probably full of your friends' adventures in baking, gardening and fitness. New York-based fashion designer Nicole McLaughlin noticed another trend. Have you seen an, an uptick in people who are like who are at home and maybe thinking, well, I, I want to try this this upcycling process or, or turning old or you know end of life items into something new? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's making me so happy to see that too, especially during all the quarantining that we've had to see how many people use that time to get creative and to try things out. And I think it was like a period where people felt actually more vulnerable and like comfortable sharing things that like maybe they wouldn't necessarily have shown the world. But I think it's um it's been really cool, especially on in the world of Instagram and TikTok specifically. I see so many younger people who have learned to sew, who have like picked up this the sewing skill of using the machines or by hand or knitting. Um, it's such a surge in what I'd say is like a lost trade. Cause I think the past couple of generations, like learning how to sew wasn't really, you know, as popular as it was many generations ago. So I definitely see a bigger um, moment of that right now, which is really inspiring. Nicole's body of work includes things like slippers made from tennis balls, furniture made of old Gatorade bottles, and a suitcase made from runners. It's weird, but it's funny. And that's what makes it effective, she says. And why do you think your take on sustainable fashion has struck such a chord with people? If for anyone listening who hasn't, I really recommend you check out Nicole's Instagram. We'll link it in the show notes because it is so creative and so clever. Why do you think people have taken to what you do? Uh, Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, I think it's just the relatability of it. I think that everyone sees the items that I'm using and can feel some type of connection to them. It's not anything that people aren't familiar with. It's usually like everyday household items that are just kind of spun in a different way. And I I just feel like it resonates because it, it does feel relatable and it almost puts a spin on sustainability that makes it feel more approachable than some of the other messaging and things that have been out there before that feels so far away from people, especially that aren't in the fashion industry. If they're just trying to get involved or understand a little bit more, this almost feels like a better way to approach the subject. And I always say like having fun with fashion is a a more approachable way because if you can start a conversation around it in a lighthearted way, even though it's a serious subject, I think that, you know, at least it's starting a conversation. Well, that's what I was going to say because I think your work is so fun and I think sustainable fashion and ethical fashion can be done very seriously and this is a serious topic that we need to be very concerned about, which on the one hand, of course, is true, but that's quite heavy and people can feel a bit um, put off by that. And so you turning tennis balls into a mitt or bread into a jacket is really fun and funny. And I think that lightness helps bring people in. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I hope to do. You know, I'm not 
trying to make everybody a sustainability expert, but just so much to get them like involved in the conversation and make it seem like it doesn't have to be so scary. I think sustainability in general, when people talk about it, it is so gloomy and dark and just thinking about the future. Like we all feel the weight and the responsibility to be able to make better choices and everything. But a lot of the time, those things are out of our hands as individuals. And it comes down more to corporations and larger companies who are causing the issues of climate change. And so I think it's it's still good for us to have those conversations. And I just I'd rather approach it in a more fun and lighthearted way, I think. Nicole is just one of the social media influencers who are changing the way people think about sustainable fashion. For all the consumerism and spending we see on our social media feeds, there's also a strong cohort of users who are modelling ethical behaviours, says Monash Business School's Dr Aloise Zopos. I think Instagram does definitely drive what people buy. You know, influencers are posting things all the time and people want to look like them, but I think there's been a real shift lately on Instagram and social media in general away from buying trends to actually buying more consciously and more mindfully. So um, a lot of trends that we're seeing on Instagram are actually influencers and people engaging in the circular economy, for example, and sharing their love for, you know, secondhand shopping as opposed to fast fashion shopping. So while we are seeing, you know, people wanting to keep up with celebrity trends on Instagram, we're also seeing people shopping for different reasons to keep up with people on Instagram, like buying ethically or buying secondhand, for example. This aligns with a larger trend, says Eloise, a global rejection of the hustle culture, an idea we explored last season on What Happens Next. What we're seeing is perhaps a a push away from fast living in general, I would say. So in the last five to 10 years, You know, there's been a real hustle culture, a real culture around busyness, uh, working nights, working weekends, commuting, always being on. And I think in the last five to 10 years, and even with the impact of COVID-19, people have really started to slow down their living. And that's not just in relation to work and family life and sea changes and tree changes. It's also about how people consume. So People are really starting to become more mindful of what they're buying. They're more conscious in what they're consuming. And that means people are more considered when it comes to how much fast fashion they're buying, for example. So in the last five years, what's really interesting is that the luxury market has been booming. So people aren't necessarily uh, buying less in general, but they might be diverting their spend away from buying heaps of fast fashion items to perhaps diverting their spend to spending more and buying a more timeless piece or a more high quality piece that will last rather than fast fashion, fast fashion all the time. And so how are we seeing not just brands, but perhaps whole sections of the industry uh, responding to, to these demands? What are companies or sectors doing to make themselves more values aligned with their customers? Yeah, there's, there's a number of strategies that companies and particularly retailers are using to appeal to these conscious consumers or to appeal to people that want to consume mindfully. So, um, for example, one of the leaders in this space has to be Patagonia. I, I couldn't not talk about Patagonia um, with this type of question. So Patagonia, the outdoor goods brand, uh, they have a number of initiatives in this space to appeal to a values-driven or, or conscious consumer. So For example, they have a repair initiative where they actually educate consumers and teach them how to repair one of their items from Patagonia or from elsewhere to discourage them from purchasing an item to replace that damaged or worn item. They're teaching people how to repair it. Uh, They also have a, a campaign recently called Don't Buy This Jacket, where, as the campaign suggests, they encouraged people to think about whether they actually needed that item before replacing it, for example, by repairing it through one of their educational videos. Uh, So they're a company that's consistently scoring an A on the Baptist World Aid Ethical Fashion Report. So that's a report that, an annual report that assigns brands a grade every year based on ethical markers like traceability or human rights or sustainability. Uh, So they're doing great things because they're 
really making it personal, uh, making it quite personal in terms of getting people to work with their hands and fix a product uh, rather than replace it. Um, but other retailers are, are doing this in different ways. So, for example, the department store David Jones now has a rent and return initiative where people can rent a garment for an event and return it afterwards rather than buying one. They also have a luxury resale platform on their website where people can buy secondhand items from the David Jones website. Uh, other retailers are doing it with products. So, for example, Adidas have recently created a sneaker that's made of 100% recycled polyester. So there's a range of retailers engaging in different strategies to appeal to these consumers. And what's really interesting is that if you think of a retailer, a fast fashion retailer like H&M, you'd think that they probably wouldn't be appealing to these consumers that are trying to engage and consume mindfully and consciously. But What's, what the fast fashion retailers are trying to do is appeal to these consumers with strategies built into their products, strategies built into their supply chain. So H&M, for example, use renewable energy in part of their supply chain. They have recycling initiatives and they actually also score an A in the ethical fashion report, which kind of seems odd that a fast fashion retailer can do well in a report like that. But fast fashion retailers often have the size and scale to invest in these initiatives. So they're also trying to appeal to these consumers in new ways as well. Of course, not every company makes repairing perfectly good products as easy as the Patagonias of the world. Here's Julie Bolton from the Monash University Sustainable Development Institute. Julie, one of the struggles that I have, and this isn't with slow fashion, but it's with, uh, I suppose, trying to reuse anything at all at the moment. I have two examples recently that have just really frustrated me. One is uh, I have some Pyrex containers, the lids disintegrated and I thought I'm not going to chuck out Pyrex containers and buy new ones. I'm just going to get some new lids. They were really difficult to find and when I found them online, just getting the lids was more expensive than buying new ones. And the exercise bike we have at home broke and the belt broke and I thought we're not going to get a new one. We're going to get it repaired. And getting it repaired is a million times more expensive than just buying a new one. So it feels like we're in this frustrating middle point where there are people who do want to do the right thing and recognize just throwing things out is a a stupid waste of time and resources and all these terrible things. But it's like the industry has not yet come to the party where it is cheaper to buy new and throw away than to repair or fix. What can we do about that, Julie? I have a very similar frustration to you. <laughs> I've, I've struggled with a lot of things and I wish, um, I think, well, gosh, I wish I had like some little handy person, handy fairy, any little handy fairy running around my house who can come in and tighten the screw and fix a few things. Um, yeah, look, I think a whole range of things can be done. Have you, I, I hope um, you guys have come across the concept of repair cafes, um, which I think are Genius. I love repair cafes. And repair cafes also come with people who know how to sew. So um, it's a concept that was started, I'm pretty sure it was started in the Netherlands and it's spread to Australia and it's a number of local groups um, who come together up here in Canberra. It's on a Saturday morning. You can book in ahead and say, I'm bringing my exercise bike. Can someone repair it? Does someone know how to repair it? And there'll be people there tinkering away who will be able to repair things, which is awesome and it absolutely needs to happen. And I think more and more people are saying there's value in this product. It's silly to throw it out. Look at all of those things that are attached to it. So I want to get it repaired. If we look at clothing, like then it's simple repairing things that can happen with clothing. It's, you know, learning how to put the button back on, fix, you know, just because there's a rip in the T-shirt, it doesn't mean it has to be thrown out. It could be fixed or it could be mended or it could be made a feature. You could your jeans that have got too many rips and then then it's no longer trendy to have rips will turn them into shorts like it's and I think this is so exciting about fashion too like I think we're at this moment in time where people are um, really embracing this imagination concept and creativity concept which for me is what fashion essentially is all about creativity and fashion and expressing yourself going to the secondhand stores and finding an outfit that you can make into your own by adding a patch on or taking a patch off or doing whatever it is. I think all of that is super exciting and I'm super pumped to see this movement really taking off. Um, 
But then at the beginning stage, I think there's a lot of work that is being done in, in the industry where people are designing for longevity. So actually designing a T-shirt or a jumper or a jacket that is designed to last and then offering repair services and repair kits. So you can buy, you can buy clothes now without actually on sell you or as part of the buying the product, they'll sell you a little repair kit or you can download instructions on how to repair. Patagonia um, over the summer in the States will go to all of the major camping grounds with a little van and offer a repair service for people with their jackets free of charge. Don't throw your jacket out, come to us, we'll repair it and it can keep going for another 20 years. And that, that's ace, right? That's what we want to have happen because the more we can use what we already have, um, the less we're putting into you know, our landfills, the less we're getting rid of just because we want to get rid of it because it's not quite right, the better our world will be. Julie and her colleague at MSDI, Alicia McCallion, emphasise that it's not enough to think about the landfill at the end of the garment's life cycle. Changes need to be made at every step of the process. One thing we've been really conscious about talking about is that Waste is, it's the end, right? If we want to get rid of waste, we actually need to start back at the beginning and we need to look at how we're designing the products and we need to focus on, again, that entire chain. So how we design, how we, how much we manufacture, where it's come from, how we're wearing it, how we're using it, how it gets to second use and reuse. Um, and then, then ultimately what happens when we waste because you know, at the moment, and then what happens with the waste also in terms of recycling, like are there actual, you know, are there systems in place, are there places in Australia that exist where we can actually take the textile, break it back down again into its fibre parts and then turn it into a new textile? And there's not enough of that happening. It's starting to happen and it's awesome and we need that to happen more and more so we can deal with the waste and it's not just waste. It actually becomes back into that circle and that's, I guess it's a really complicated answer of saying focusing on a circular economy, focusing on textiles becoming a circular product where there is no waste, so there is no way. We have to get that into our mindset that there should no longer be any waste. What can an individual do, Alicia? If you love fashion, you want to keep looking trendy, what do you do? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, It's a great question for ourselves to reflect on and I think you always want to just start from where you are. So you know, the, there's a phrase that like the most sustainable garment is the one that's already in your wardrobe. You know, you already have it. It's already made. The resources have been invested. Um, so cherish it and value it. Although the most sustainable garment is in your wardrobe already, you know, fall in love with it again, revalue it, revalue the resources and the time and the energy that's gone into it. Um, think about repairing it before you discard it. Um, and also just, you know, when you're evaluating your textiles, think about your food intake, think about the other things that you're conscious of. If you're trying to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, then you can think about that as far as your, your clothing, as well as your food. So for example, I always say, um, or recently coined the idea that, you know, you don't take a bite out of an apple and then just toss the apple in a pile. That's just not acceptable, right? We, we understand that fundamentally as waste. And so why would we wear one outfit or, or, or an outfit one time and then just toss it and be tired of it? But at the end of the day, um, considering having second hand in the mix, you know, considering having um, just less, um, you know, thinking about having only maybe two pairs of denim instead of 16. Um, Just questioning how much you need um, and how much you're willing to consume and and also then what can you do with it? Um, When you are finished, is there there a really great way to donate? We have a really amazing scale system in Australia to recirculate all of these amazing goods. But if we drop them off in a, in a manner that's not really ready for use for someone else, it's not in good shape, then that's actually just per- perpetuating the problem. So being mindful about caring for that garment, uh, mending it, using it to its fullest. There's a hashtag wear it out, um, really simple. And then when you do go to donate it and pass it on, do that in a way that's also mindful. So make sure it's freshly laundered, it's folded, it's ready to go into the donation um, collection point um, with respect and ready for someone else to purchase and use it. So I think individuals can just start from where they are and take a few steps to be more conscious about their choices and the impacts of them. Um, and and I think a way to do that is just is just be kind to yourself and take a few steps. Nicole thinks we can all be a little kinder to the brands that are taking their own small steps too. 
there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that we don't know about. And a lot of the time, brands don't always advertise all the things they're doing from a sustainability standpoint. And it's a bummer because I think people would want to see that. But as soon as they say like, oh, you know, we're pushing to be like getting all recycled packaging or something, then they almost feel like they have to like really own up to that. And so I almost feel like brands shy away from that. It's interesting when you say that it made me wonder in the same way as individual consumers, we sort of tell each other, you know, you don't have to be perfect. Just make this one change, you know, start checking the labels, buy secondhand more, reuse, et cetera, and, you know, work your way up to being to being a more ethical consumer. I wonder if perhaps we need to extend the same grace to brands as well and say, okay, it's great that you've got recyclable packaging. We're not going to then be like, but what about this? And what about that? Start with that and then improve on that and keep stepping towards that. I wonder if our um, adamance that everyone needs to be perfect immediately and all the time might actually stop people from trying at all. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's something I definitely talk a lot about um, with my friends and and consumers in general, just because like people always put so much pressure on these really large companies that have been doing something a certain way for a really long time. Like some companies are 50 years old and it's like for them to go and completely change their business practices. I mean, I think it's, it's important if they haven't started doing it, it's like, where, what are you doing at this point? Um, But I'd say we have to be able to kind of like, give them a little bit of space give them a little bit of breathing room and show us like what you're doing like really show us like your pathway forward be transparent in that way and when there is something that we like from a brand that's actually working on sustainable stuff tell them that you like it you know really like understand that they're doing their best and um see see how it goes before you judge them i'd say (laughs) Longtime fashion journalist and editor Janice Breen Burns is hopeful about the future. We imbue fashion with so many values that it doesn't have. It can't raise us, give us that buzz, and raise us um, uh, uh, beyond our own reality. It can't. Um, it can't make us cooler. It can't make us prettier. It can't. It can't do all that. Um, but it can. Um, uh, it can make us feel really, really good about ourselves if we're careful about what we buy. It can make us look the best we could possibly look and make the best possible impression. And if we buy less of us, less, less of it, we'll be plugged into this whole question in in the world at the moment, um, what are you doing um, as a responsible citizen? What are you doing as a responsible consumer to preserve our environment, to, to make a better world? So, and that's the future of fashion. This is our final What Happens Next episode on sustainable fashion. Thanks to all our guests today, Janice Breen Burns, Nicole McLaughlin, Alicia McCallion, Julie Bolton, and Dr. Aloise Zopos. We've also included links to a few of our guests' favorite resources for becoming a more ethical consumer. If you're enjoying What Happens Next, don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and share the show with your friends. Thanks for joining us. See you next week with an all-new topic. 